So I do need to just um, get the site up because I had this very ambitious idea that I was going to take you on a journey through Kent Maps whilst um, presenting. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so I'll just bring the site up. So um, I'm going to take you on this journey and I'm going to introduce you to hopefully three writers, although time is against me. And um, we're going to look at their motivations for coming to Kent. So I'm going to start in Broadstairs in 1852. And so I need to move to my 19th century to do that. And um, there's going to be a spoiler alert next. We're going to go to George Eliot. So, um, jo well, I'm going to call her Marianne Evans throughout the talk because she hasn't actually become George Eliot in 1852. Um, she's uh, at the start of her career, really. And she comes to stay for the summer. And on arrival, she writes to her friends and says, I warn you against Ramsgate, which is a strip of London come out for an airing. Broadstairs is perfect. And I have the snuggest little lodgings conceivable with a motherly good woman and a nice little damsel of 14 to wait on me. Marianne had moved to London two years earlier. Sorry, are there Sorry, some messages? I think, yes, <laughs> just saying, I think the share screen. Are they not seeing the... Oh, you're not seeing the screen on that, fine. Oh, okay. So Have I not shared properly? Sorry. All right, let's have a look. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we did try this yesterday and it was, work yeah, <laughs> it was working windowed, perfectly. Sorry. I, I was still on the share screen, right. sorry. Let's that one through. Yeah. Lovely. Is that better? Can, Can you, if anybody can't a... see, let us know. No one's saying okay. anything, so I'm assuming okay. they can now see that. Right, so, um, so yeah, so, so Marianne had moved to London two years earlier with the intention of becoming a writer and had gained work at the Westminster Review. But the work was depressing her and by July 1852 she was sadly in want of the change. So she wrote to her friend Sarah Hennell and she said she was bothered to death with article reading and scrap work of all sorts. It's clear my poor head will never produce anything under these circumstances. And her first novel was not published until another seven years. So it was unusual for a single woman at this time to go on holiday alone. And so uh, the Chapmans with whom she was living, that's her publisher and his wife, they escorted her to the coast. So this gave her an air of respectability about her stay. And she found lodgings at Chandos Cottage. Uh, now, this is where I'm trying to be clever and uh, show you the site as well as. Um, OK, so. Um, uh, Carolyn and I we went to uh, the Dickens Museum and were fortunate enough to be able to digitise this um, 1843 Broadstairs rate book, which um, enabled me to see Chandos Cottage, um, which is just here, and we can see Melinda Edgar's, Edgar. So uh, this is the uh, uh, motherly good woman, and uh, through censuses I can see that her good little damsel was um, a young lady called uh, Eliza Bishop. So she's found um, accommodation at Chandos Cottage, and um, we can see if we move down um, the map, uh, this is a map of uh, Broadstairs from 1824. We can see uh, Chandos Place along the bottom here, and this I am assuming this little blob on the corner here is Chandos Cottage because um, there are um, listed in the rate book about, I think it's about eight houses and then the cottage. So, um, so we've now got this picture of where um, uh, Mary Ann Evans was staying. And um, Broadstairs at this time was considered a fashionable sea bathing resort, um, but it was popular um, with those who liked retirement, who liked a quieter experience, because Margate and Ramsgate were uh, jam-packed with visitors. So this was a, a quieter, more genteel experience. Um, so Evans, uh, while she's there, she wrote to John Chapman and uh, she said, 
I feel that I am wretched. Um, I'm a wretched helpmate to you, almost out of the world and incognito, so far as I am in it. When you can afford to pay an editor, if that time will ever come, you must get one. So if, as this letter implies, Evans didn't receive per payment for her work, it would explain her choice of broadstairs, because not only was it quieter, it was cheaper. Um, so uh, to find out a bit more about Chandos Cottage, uh, Evans describes it as a, a sitting room about eight feet by nine and a bedroom a little larger. Yet in that small space, there is almost every comfort. And she wrote to her friend Cara Bray to say that she paid a guinea a week for her rooms. So uh, I had to look up a guinea. That's one pound, one shilling a week. So about eight pounds and eight shillings. So if I go, um, so we've got people in the lobby. Let's have a look what's happening here. Sorry about this. OK. So if we go back to the um, rate book, we can actually see how much this property cost um, for uh, the landlady. Um, here we are, Shandos Cottage. So it was £11. So um, the £8 um, and eight shillings that uh, Marianne Evans was paying was going to cover considerably the um, rent for that cottage for the year. Um, so I then looked, wonderful these rate books, I had a look at uh, Fort House, where Dickens spent his summers, and that had um, a yearly uh, rental of £38.10. shillings. So we can discover from the rate book the sorts of size of properties and the values of the properties that these two writers could stay at. Uh, Marianne adds, I shall not ruin myself by staying a month unless I commit excesses in coffee and sugar. So Coffee and sugar weren't that expensive at the time, unlike tea, which was three times the price of coffee. But it does reveal those additional charges that were imposed by landladies at seaside lodgings. And if you want to know a bit more about this, there is another um, page on the site uh, which links to a book um, called How We Did Without Lodgings at the Seaside. But I digress. So let's go back to poor Miss Evans in her two rooms at Broadstairs. So she continues, I am thinking whether it would not be wise to retire from the world and live here for the rest of my days. With some fresh paper on the walls and an easy chair, I think I could resign myself. So clearly Shandos Cottage is a little bit shabby. However, although Evans seems to be watching the pennies, and this may explain the choice of the Kent coast, it's more than just a cheap escape. It's an emotional one. So Evans was suffering from unrequited love, having recently been spurned by philosopher and biologist Herbert Spencer, who incidentally coined the phrase survival of the fittest, not, um, not Darwin. And um, she had met him through her friend, the publisher, John Chapman. Shortly after her arrival, Evans, who was still in love with Herbert Spencer, invites him down to visit, which is quite risque really because she's there on her own and she invites him to visit and um, she writes to him no credit to me for my virtues as a refrigerant I owe them all to a few lumps of ice which I carried away from me from that tremendous glacier of yours so clearly she knows that he's not interested she's been rebuffed um, he comes to stay um, but and they share lots of walks along the seaside and uh, she talks about the flowers she picks um, but he makes it quite clear that he doesn't feel the same way. Um, and in his autobiography, he's subtle, but he describes her as the most admirable woman mentally I ever met. Um, but it's her manliness and her lack of physical, um, uh, there's a lack of physical attraction between them. And he incidentally didn't marry and so sorry, this is a, 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 a terrible joke, but clearly there was no survival of his gene pool. <laughs> so, so in a letter to Spencer, Evans, aware of her own failure to attract him, made analogies between herself and the evolutionary biology he favoured. And she compares herself to starfish and sea eggs. So um, she's um, soaking in the environment around her. Um, um, she refused to talk about her emotions with her friends 
um, preferring to imbibe the peaceful beauty and dignity um, of the uh, Broadstairs environment. She remained there for two months before she returned to town. Uh, she kept up her work, reading and reviewing articles. And in the end, it was a swarm of harvest bugs and ladybirds biting her legs that drove her back to London. So um, I just want to say, um, and if we go further into the article, we'll see um, uh, as we go down, uh, we, we find out about her journey. There's Herbert Spencer. Um, we try really hard at Kent Maps to make sure that everything is as precise as possible. So this is the closest that I can get a picture of him in 1858 to the moment 1852. And so I will not choose a picture of him with like grey whiskers, you know, when he's 90, because it doesn't fit the moment of, of the romance. But the, that's sometimes difficult fitting the, uh, the images to go with the story. Um, and so you can see some of the flowers she picked and she talks about David Copperfield, etc. And there's the lady, Lady Bird. And then finally, she does come to Kent again. She goes to Dover. This time she's in a relationship with George Henry Lewis. He's um, married. It's an open relationship with his wife. And so they start living together. Uh, but when they, they, they live together in Germany and then they come back and they realise that there are some uh, problems they have you know, will encounter in the in, in England. So she stays at the Lord Warden Hotel for six weeks while he makes arrangements in London. So um, I put this image up of Snargate Street, which is um, uh, the street that leads down uh, along the docks and where the Lord Warden Hotel is at the end. Um, uh, because I couldn't get an, uh, a picture of the Lord Warden Hotel that fitted this era. And I, and I know that's probably me uh, obsessing about detail, but th this is the closest I could get. Um, when I, I looked through um, Elliot's work and there, there's nothing about the seaside, it's all in the Midlands. Uh, and you know, I was thinking, did, did anything rub off from Kent? Because that's what we like to see, that people are influenced by Kent. And um, the only thing I could find was she talks about um, a character, Joshua Featherstone Rigg. And it says, from his earliest employment as an errand boy in a seaport, he had looked through the windows of the money changers as other, other boys looked through the windows of the pastry cooks. And this for me was Snargate Street. And I'm going to show you why this was Snargate Street. So um, I'm now going to talk about another writer called Florence Warden. And I'm going to, uh, so I just need to introduce her. Let's go home. And Florence is another 19th century writer. In fact, they're all going to be 19th century writers. Um, okay. So, um, so Florence wrote a book called Little Miss Prim, published in 1898, and it's set in Dover, not far from the Lord Warden Hotel. And in it, Miss Prim, who is actually called Miss Crewe, so you can see there's a little bit of a, a, a joke going on here. Uh, she asks the family she's staying with whether she can go to Dover that afternoon to do some shopping. And uh, so she gets on the four o'clock train, which intrigued me massively. The idea that you get on a train at four o'clock and be in Dover and the shops would still be open. But as my husband reassures me, shops stayed open a lot later then. And um, so she, she goes down to uh, Snargate Street and that's, you know, the train comes right into, Sna uh, into Dover at that place, uh, it's Snargate Street then. Um, and she, she gets off and she starts looking at the jewellers and she looks at the contents of all the windows and um, she starts um, looking um, and eventually goes into one and she sells her watch. Now, we know this because Osmond, who lives in the house uh, where she's staying, has observed her and got on his bike and cycled after her to see where she's going. Now, that's another thing that intrigues me, how um, you get to Dover on a four o'clock train, where are you coming from to get there, uh, and for someone to cycle and get there and observe you all in the same time. So that's something that I will be trying to work out as I map the journey on the, on the site. So, um, so Miss Crewe sells her watch, and uh, he um, 
she's caught in the act by Osmond and he does what all creepy Victorian stalkers do. He takes her to the pastry cooks. <laughs> and so, you know, so I'm thinking pastry cooks and, you know, it's very, you know, similar to that sort of moment in Middlemarch. So uh, the, the pastry cooks, um, he gives her tea and plum cake and uh, he tells her he's been suspicious about her. Anyway, the next day, uh, a friend of Osmond's who has fallen in love with Miss Crewe decides to go to Dover and buy back her watch because he doesn't want her to be without her watch. And the jeweller says, and the bracelet too, sir? And he, he says, oh, um, uh, the bracelet. And he gets out a bracelet and it's his grandmother's heirloom. And he's, he then realises that possibly Miss Crewe has been stealing things in the house. So, uh, and, and there is a, a, a reason for it. And if you read Florence Warden, there's always lots of twists and turns. So why have I taken you down this circuitous path where I've started telling you about um, somebody uh, selling off their jewels in Dover? Well, there's a good reason because I'm now going to talk about Florence Warden and as a writer, she produced over 150 novels. Uh, she writes numerous plays, short stories. She is prolific, yet she's continually in and out of debt. And she has the pants sued off her by several very litigious theatre managers and actors over production rights for her books. Um, she had £200 worth of jewels at the pawnbrokers in 1909 and she was living in Sandgate at the time. So uh, I have a feeling she understood where you could sell off your jewels quite easily or pawn them. But she was also begging the Royal Literary Fund to stump up the cash to help her to get them back. So Florence Warden, uh, she moved to Ramsgate initially in 1891 and later to Sandgate in 1898. So you can see the image of, um, uh, well, I've actually got Hythe up at the moment because she writes a story about Hythe. But um, there, there she is um, in all her glory. Um, and let's move her down. Um, so, oh, there we are. Well, here we are at Ramsgate. So um, she moves to Ramsgate. Uh, she's married, four children, um, she's the main breadwinner, her husband George, failed actor, he works as her secretary, you know, she works extraordinarily hard, she produces six novels a year, um, and, but this woman really knew what poverty was, because, um, and this is reflected in the title of her first novel, The Wolf at the Door, um, she'd had a very privileged childhood, but she, the, her family had lost everything and she had to pull her way up, claw her way up. And, um, but also her father is extremely dodgy. You know, he, he's a stockbroker. He's changing businesses all the time, conning clients, debtors prison. This is, the, this is the environment she's grown up in. And yet she's really trying. So she comes to Ramsgate, I think, or with, with debtors at her door, she comes to Ramsgate to escape. And but but she loves the high life. So she she rents a house that costs forty pounds per annum, which is quite expensive, really. And um, uh, she has quite a, a golden time in Ramsgate. She's writing. She's she's meeting people. It all seems very successful. And she she decides to buy a house. Now that's quite bold in 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 those times to to go and buy a house. And so she decides to buy this house in Sandgate, um, but things all go downhill after this because um, what happens is uh, something happens to her cottage and she's very vague about this. She says that she has to leave her cottage at a day's notice due to sanitary conditions. Now it could be um, there was floods, it could be that flood water came up in the house and they had to um, dry it out, but it stood empty for three years. It could also be um, she writes complaining to um, the hospital magazine about diseased people from London being dumped in Sandgate and how she um, uh, has them on her doorstep and her children are exposed to these diseases. So there's some sanitary problem that she's not happy about. So she spends three years outside, out of her property. So that's rent and a mortgage. 
by 1909, she is on the brink of bankruptcy. And um, she, this is when she writes to the Literary Fund for the first time, begging for money. She says, I'm beset with duns and lawyer's threats by every post. And she is, there's, there's details about how um, she actually takes a brick and threatens to throw it through one of her um, uh, one of the debt collectors windows if they keep harassing her anymore she doesn't go through with it but she's so desperate and 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 she says everybody in Folkestone is aware of this desperate situation she's in she's got 210 pounds in, in tutors fees so when you look at her debts is that she's eventually very concerned about her family she's she's had education for her children she's got butcher's fees of 26 pounds station at five pounds coal four pounds the list goes on so so she's absolutely consumed by this um fear of becoming bankrupt like her father um she can no longer write it's just affecting her so much and so um she says, I have absolutely come to the end of my career as the novelist, having had to sell a novel of 80,000 pounds, um, 80,000 words for 10 pounds. So that's how low the currency of her work was getting. With her with one of her first novels, she got 300 pounds. She's now down to 10 pounds. And, and I know we can't blame the Kent coast for destroying the hopes of, a, of, of this very industrious woman, but you know, that wretched storm or those um, disease Londoners did something so um and her you know all, all the people she writes for say she's a very conscientious and reliable client but there is also another thing going on and that is that she's becoming less popular and so she, this is why they're not offering her the huge sum that she had previously she's just there's too many of her books on their catalogues she's just not sellable anymore so what had initially proved to be a nice cheap haven the kent coast turned into an expensive nightmare and florence was forced to leave kent when her house was repossessed so i don't know if i've got time for my third person uh, sorry, sorry, what, what was that very, very, very quick. quick. Okay, so my third person is Henrietta Vaughan Stannard, also known as John Strange Winter. Um, now, you would never know that she lived in Kent because she doesn't really want to mention it. It is clearly a, sh a shameful moment for her because um, this is when she's really hard up. So she, she moves to Kent. Um, she, she, her mistake was uh, she had written a few um, you know, successful novels. Then she decides to run her own journal and this was the venture that pushed the family over the over the financial edge and um, so she kept it going for four years made huge losses on her journal the golden gates as it's originally called and then um, the, their health starts failing but it, it made me realize that somehow um, health is a good excuse so we go to the seaside for our health because you know we, we we you know that's what we do but actually i think a lot of people use health as an excuse for i'm really struggling here financially i need to get away and hide it and this is what i wonder about her because in every newspaper report it's a different member of her family who is unwell oh it's my poor eldest daughter oh it's my poor youngest daughter oh it's my husband oh it's me there's always somebody who's unwell in her house and maybe that's true but, you know, I started seeing some discrepancies um, creeping up in the reports. And um, one of the um, uh, things I want to just read to you is um, a uh, Mary Elizabeth Braddon story that um, Carolyn has got on one on the other pages. And it's called The World, the Flesh and the Devil. And in the story, a character called Justin Jamin uh, claims to have headed to a bard, so it's in a bathing resort in Bohemia, um, but another character believes this to be a lie, saying, I believe he invents a name and a bard every summer and then goes quietly and lies up the country between Broadstairs and Birchington and basks all day upon some solitary stretch of sand or on the edge of some lonely cliff where the North Sea breezes blow. So, um, you know, so Braddon has, you know, twigged that people make these lies. They go and hide up in um, Kent resorts that are the really fashionable ones. And uh, they, 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 they plead illness or, or, or whatever, and, and, and they, but they can live there quite cheaply. Um, uh, 
it would be totally unfair not to mention that uh, in one of the years she comes, she's pregnant. And, and, but that is very well hidden uh, throughout her, uh, her stay in, her, in, the, in the newspaper. She's hiding that. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, so maybe that's another reason she came. So uh, I do think I'd probably run out of time. Uh, I think what I was um, hoping that um, you would um, appreciate is that uh, coming to the Kent coast can be about cheapness. But often it's about escape, it's about recuperation, uh, both emotional and physical, but also a place to enjoy the seaside. And we can't deny it, it is a good place for that. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I think what we will do is we will take questions for Ralph and Michelle together at the end, if that is... All right, it sort of inspired me to go down. To, it doesn't take much to inspire me to go down to Broadstairs, I have to say, but I do feel I want to go. And, and 